Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the Berkshire High Peaks New Year's Bash reunion. My name is Carolyn Regula, and I will be your host for the New Year's events. All of our sessions are being recorded and will be live streamed on YouTube as well. We have master classes and lectures. So if you can't make one of our previous events, all will be archived and available on the Close Encounters with Music YouTube channel. Berkshire High Peaks Festival is a part of Close Encounters with Music and their mission is to engage the imagination of diverse concert audiences in a welcoming setting to connect listeners to performers and composers and foster the excitement and sense of community that live performance builds. To establish a comfortable listening environment and turn performances into enriching and educational experiences. So below in your Zoom toolbar, you will see a chat window, which you can use to talk amongst yourselves during our presentation. If you have any questions for any of our guests today, please submit them using the Q&A feature, which will also be found at the bottom of your screen. I have to say, I myself am super excited for this panel we have today. We have so many countries represented. We have five professional musicians joining us and they're gonna share their experiences with you about this past year. And I really hope it inspires you all to persevere in the coming 2021 year. And maybe it will spark some of your own ideas for creative productivity. And to introduce them and to help facilitate our presentation today, I am honored to introduce the Artistic Director of Close Encounters with Music, Yehuda Hanani. Thank you very much, Carolyn, for this very lovely introduction. Um, in spite of the COVID-19, or maybe thanks to it, there is this rare opportunity for me to get together with former students who are now successfully active all across the, really in the four corners of the earth, four continents, and uh, get a, a global picture of where we are as, as musicians and, and uh, discuss how, how they are coping, uh, what their vision for the future is, and uh, whatever else you, all, all five of you wish to, to share with our audiences. Um, maybe we should start by introducing each of you to, to our viewers and listeners. So we have Serom Kwon, who is a professor in Seoul, Korea. Hagit Glazer, who teaches in Israel. Mikhail Darmani, who is our, our American representative this morning, or I should say this morning, this afternoon, and this evening, so we can include all of you. Wayne Smith from Berlin, the, uh, Hans Eisler Hochschule, and did I mention all of you? And oh my goodness, and Diego, who is the first chair of, in the Buenos Aires Philharmonica in Argentina. So hello, everybody. It's a tremendous thrill for me. Uh, why don't we start with the ladies? So Hagit, tell us who you are, anything about yourself, and then we'll get move on to say Rome. Um, well, first of all, I studied with you <laughs> in the past. Um, I teach here in, uh, in Tel Aviv, in the Israeli Conservatory uh, in Tel Aviv, and also in a part of a university called Levinsky for degrees, and um, also perform lots of chamber music and uh, so on, and solo, but uh, during this time, uh, we try to continue with Zoom, and uh, and my kids and I are playing a lot of chamber music at home. I feel very lucky about that. Um, this is mainly who I am at the moment. Serom, are you there? Okay. Yeah. 
My name is Serum Kwan. Uh, now I live in Korea. Um, I'm teaching at the Gangnam University. I'm a um, music department chair as well as the director of the Young Musicians Academy here. I studied with Mr. Hanani for my DMA uh, at Cincinnati, uh, CCM. And I've been joining uh, the High Peaks uh, Festival for the past couple of years. So I was able to see him for the uh, summertime. And yeah, Great. that's it. <laughs> and now we go to Dieguito. Um, yeah, I'm Diego. I play in the Buenos Aires Philharmonic in the Teatro Colón in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And I also teach at the Institute of the same theater and young students. And I have also a, a small private studio um, some students that I teach uh, privately. Uh, and also I study with, of course, with Mr. Hanani. We, uh, Serum and I were in Cincinnati at the same time, both working for the DMA with you, so that's that's who I am. It's, it's a very happy reunion here. And yep. uh, Mikel Darmani. Good morning. Can you guys hear me clearly? We do. Good, good, beautiful, beautiful. So I'm the, the odd one out in the group. I'm a pianist, wow. but I've also <laughs> but you, gotten you were, to work you were, with. You were in the studio as well for a long time, playing with a lot of the I, I was my my professor. I would imagine Pratt when I was at Cincinnati, like Diego and Seram. He um, said, "Before you leave here, you need to take some repertoire for cello and piano and meet and play for Yehuda and Ani." And I did, and the relationship has grown with ten years now. And that's it. <laughs> that's the age myself. But the rest, and the rest is, is history. history. Yeah. And um, I'm in I'm in New York. I'm a New York based artist, but I'm actually in North Carolina right now. I got to, you know, make sure that I was yeah. healthy and visit. I'm visiting family in North Carolina now. So I'm out of the city for a few weeks. One, one, thank you, Mikael. One day when, when your students grow up and, and enter the profession, you'll see the thrill when former students become colleagues and partners. It's a tremendous, tremendous joy. and. I had the pleasure of playing with Mikhail a number of concerts already, and uh, he is really hot. <laughs> uh, so Wayne, I, I think you are the oldest among the, this uh, former students group, isn't? Are you? I'm noticing that. Yes. <laughs> I think we met each other somewhere around 1980 in Aspen first, and then I worked with you in New York. Uh, and moved to Cincinnati because of you. Uh, and I came to Berlin in 1997. You visited once at the Hochschule for Masterclass. And I teach uh, chamber music at the Hans Eisler Hochschule. I don't have any cello students there, but I do have a cello class, uh, both through the Musikschule here, uh, where I live, and also in the, the pre-college division uh, of the Hochschule. My wife is principal second of the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra, so I also have a orchestra perspective as well. Right. And it's wonderful to see you. Wonderful to be with all of you. Maybe we should work backwards now. And since you mentioned the orchestras, tell us a little bit about how the orchestras are doing in Germany. Um, is Philharmonie open, the concert hall? Um, does your wife go to work? Do they have rehearsals? Um, that's very interesting and actually quite uh, to do with what's going on right now today. Uh, there will be a meeting tomorrow to decide how much longer our hard lockdown continues. We had a hard lockdown back in April, May, where the, the orchestra did not play and the Hochschule was closed and everything happened online. Then we had a soft lockdown starting mid-June that went all the way till December 16th. Hmm. During that, School went back to normal. We, we taught, we had, there were restrictions everywhere. How many people could be in which room? And gradually the orchestra went from chamber music size up larger, larger each week. Uh, 
in the Philharmonic. They were open until December 16th, and they're now closed through January 10th. But tomorrow there's a big meeting to decide how the numbers look and whether it stays that way or not. And how about the school? The school was, uh, I taught normally all fall. However, uh, April, May, I did everything online. At the moment, we're expecting that basically January will be online. And if the numbers improve enough, we will go back to business in February. So everything is in flux. They may move the vacation and, and push the semester into March, which is normally vacation time. Mm -hmm. There are, well, yeah. Uh, Mikael, do you have anything to tell us about how your schedule works out these days under the circumstances? Yeah, I've been kind of fortunate that a lot of my projects were able to transition to the virtual or remote kind of setting. And um, another thing I've been really having to study like computer coding to rehearse with new software called Jack Trip coming out of Stanford that kind of, you know, when we speak over Zoom, there's a delay. When you teach over Zoom, there's a delay. It's almost impossible. There's new software from California that removes compression. So it removes latency. So it can almost be as if we are in a room together and your breath is an actual cue. It's, but it's so user unfriendly that you really have to study the mechanics of like what is computing, what is coding in D. So the, the, delay, the delay has been reduced so or is it completely- Fascinating about, oh, it's, it's almost imperceptible if you get it working correctly. Is there a question of mileage? You have to be a certain distance from the other person? You, usually 300 to 350 miles seems to be the extent of where you're not able to perceive a little bit of latency and above this distance you begin to notice it again a little bit but they're they've been doing you know by coastal things and also they've started rehearsing with people in california and people in beijing people in california in europe so it's like technology is fastly trying to keep up with what we've been forced to, to do right so it's incredible um, when yeah. you think what we, would have, what we would have done without Zoom, it would have been a, an unbelievable disaster. This is sort of a, teach, a steal away teach from over the cell phone. in touch with <laughs> You'd be teaching over a rotary <laughs> phone. <laughs> <laughs> Diego, why don't you describe what would have been or what was a normal day of work for you before the crisis and how it has changed now? Um, yeah, sure. Um, well, we, Argentina, locked down pretty early uh, during the pandemic, uh, since March. Um, all the theaters in Argentina have been closed. Uh, so uh, th there are two orchestras in the, in the Colón Theater, and we haven't had any, any activity since then, other than the usual, you know, short videos, streamings, and you know, the collage, uh, typical videos that everybody uh, has done during the pandemic. Um, and we are just waiting uh, to to resume activities. But so far, uh, I mean, I, I played, uh, I think, the last concert. We, we did two concerts in March. And after that, uh, that that's where we, when we start the, the season. And after that, uh, we were all confined and all the theaters closed. Uh, so I've been basically mostly teaching. I, I decided to focus on my students. Uh, I think they were the most in, in need uh, rather than uh, it, it doesn't really appeal to me to, to create videos and, and play uh, with no audience and uh, with uh, miles between each player. Uh, I've heard about the uh, software, like uh, Michael was uh, saying, I heard about Jam Kazam, I think it's uh, how it's pronounced. I think it's a similar thing, like what you are describing. Uh, but th the usual activity before that, it was uh, uh, one concert per week uh, for each orchestra, well, one of the orchestras uh, does operas. Uh, I'm in the Philharmonic, so we 
we mostly play concerts, but we used to rehearse every day, uh, Tuesday to Saturday, one concert a week, and th that was our usual schedule. Um, we don't know what, what's going to happen now. Uh, playing, playing on the stage in front of an empty hall is a very surreal I know. feeling. I mean, I had a concert with the Escher Quartet. We did the Bram Sertet. They, right. they were in tears because they said it was for the first time in seven months that they were on a stage playing chamber music together. Of course, we kept a six feet, six feet distance. Uh, so the, the quartet took the entire stage. Uh, playing a concert, uh, it's definitely not <clears throat> what we are used to. Serom, can you add to this from your perspective from Korea? Are there concerts taking place at the Sejon Center? Yes, there are concerts taking places and um, until uh, end of November, I would say about uh, from June to end of November, we were okay, pretty okay. So we were still having social distancing and everything, but mm. I was still teaching um, on campus just for lessons and chamber music. And there were concerts um, happening, uh, but you know there was a limit for the, the number of audience that we could take in. Uh, do you mind if I show some of the pictures now, or should I come back later? Please, whenever you want, of course. We would love it. Okay. Carolyn, do you mind sharing my uh, slide? Absolutely. I'll call that up now. So, of course, yeah, many concerts that I uh, <laughs> that I was supposed to play in, you know, many got cancelled, but there are a few concerts that I did, and there's one... Um, the second slide, let's go to the second slide. Interesting project that I was invited to play. This is this was called 24 hour project. And I was if you could see the I don't know if you could see the pictures, but um, I was uh, uh, invited to play with uh, the Erato ensemble. We played Tchaikovsky Serenade and uh, Holberg, um, Greek Holberg Suite. And what this project was uh, there was a, a chamber music uh, group playing uh, for 24 hours, and it was done YouTube live only. So we started on Friday at 5 p.m., and the concert ended the next day, Saturday, 5 p.m. So each hour, a group of chamber uh, musicians came in and played for about 45 to 50 minutes, and they went out, and the next hour, um, different group came in. So there were groups playing like 2 a.m., 3 a.m., 4, <laughs> 4 a.m. And luckily, my group got uh, to play at 4 p.m., last, uh, last in the order. So it was fine for me. Uh, but then in the, this is some uh, project that they did, and they got government grant for it. And so it was done for 24 hours. And the staff were filming and uh, taking care of all the schedule. They didn't sleep for 24 hours. Uh, but you know, this is one of the projects that I did, and it was we in the rehearsals. We all um, were wearing masks for, but just for the concert, they let us uh, take off the mask. Can mm -hmm. we go to the next slide? Yeah. So if you can see, uh, we were uh, we could invite maximum ten people in the hall. It was a very small hall, like like a house concert setting. And there were uh, many cameras, and so they were filming, and it was done YouTube live. Did a lot of people watch it and listen to it? Yes, and you you can still uh, find it on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Great, we look for it. Uh, can we go to the next one? And luckily, I did my recital uh, in October. Uh, so um, that time. I didn't send out many invitations, but we were allowed to have audience that time in October. So, but if you could see, I don't know uh, the picture. You, they had uh, social distance seating, so you know I couldn't uh, uh, fill out the hall. But yeah, so people were sitting. So I had about two hundred audience. Great. Did you get compliments for the beautiful dress? <laughs> <laughs> As you know, I got it a very cheap at the Macy's when I went to <laughs> <in> March. <laughs> well, it looks beautiful on you. 
next next audit next slide next slide yeah so this is uh, called uh, ceramic palace hall and this is my re rehearsal uh, picture and if you see on the wall they, it's all made with ceramic so the acoustics are very uh, very fine in this hall right next slide please And uh, I was allowed to take off the mask during the performance, but everybody in the audience, they had to wear a mask. So it was really weird watching uh, the audience with everyone with mask on. But mm -hmm. when I went out to greet the audience, you know, we all had to wear a mask. But I don't know if you could see the, the students there, the students who participated in the High Peaks Festival. I, yes, I recognize him. Yes, yes, yes. yes. <laughs> So luckily, I, I, I could do my recital. Mm -hmm. And next Great. slide, please. And um, there was one piece that I, I did with a, a saxophone player, uh, Kapustin by Kapustin. There was a duo for sax alto saxophone and cello. And he lived kind of far away, uh, like about three hours apart. So we couldn't meet often. So we did um, a few rehearsals on Zoom. Uh, it wasn't as uh, as good as I thought it could be, but you know, at, at least it was better than nothing. So we did some uh, Zoom rehearsal. Next slide. And of course, I did many online teachings. And uh, this is uh, the young musicians, uh, students from Young Musicians Academy. Um, and we did actually about 80% of the classes we did uh, on campus lessons but you know about 20% we had to switch to online lessons and it was actually fine if you could see on the left side it's Chuhi. Mm -hmm. next slide please and i did uh, a very few chamber music coaching online uh, but uh, but it was difficult to do um, but most of the other classes uh, I had, we were allowed to do uh, on campus. So that's that's what I've been doing this year, this past year. Hagit, what is the picture in Israel? Um, well, right now there is a sort of a lockdown, which is not really clear. Um, uh, we are being checked only from 6 p.m. So. Until 6 p.m., I'm not going to talk about it on YouTube, but different things are happening. And uh, I have been able to teach um, during the day, sort of. Uh, the, um, the Philharmonic, they're doing mainly chamber music concerts online. Mm -hmm. I, sometimes I play there as well. Um, also, uh, the chamber music concerts, none of them are taking place. Most of my, my neighbors now, right now have COVID. Sick, they're ill, my neighbors. Oh boy. So I try not to take the elevator. Actually, I'm not leaving most of the time. Uh, but I teach a lot of, on Zoom. It's, it, there's a lot of action going on. It's, mm -hmm. it's uh, very dramatic. <clears throat> um, but also my students and I have a uh, a meeting, a concert once a week on Zoom every Wednesday evening. Um, and we have meetings of uh, uh, etudes. Everyone has to play some, uh, uh, some something that is difficult for them and they have to talk about what's difficult for them to introduce it and to play for the others. So that's helping them to stay uh, motivated and that's that's very important for me that they're all motivated. Maybe <clears throat> since you started talking about students, we should have make this our next topic for uh, discussion. Um, for this reunion that, that will last, for th this is the second day, we have another day tomorrow. We have invited two psychiatrists who both happen to be very fine amateur musicians. One is a clarinet player and one is a very good pianist to talk to the students and just boost their morale, give them hope, make them understand what, what's going on because a lot of students are having a hard time keeping the discipline, keeping the momentum, uh, practicing, uh, uh, not getting depressed. Maybe we could talk about that too because I find it, it took me a long time to adjust to the idea 
that I cannot put my finger on a student's finger and say, this is how you hold, or this is what you do, or uh, not being in the same room. The vibrations are so different. Uh, we take it for granted now. Here you are, I'm talking to you, you are in Tel Aviv. We think that this is natural. It took me some time to, ac to accept this. So how are your students coping? Do any of them get depressed? Do any of them stop playing? Uh, tell us about that a little bit, and then we'll move back uh, to all five of you and hear some reactions to that. There, um, well, none of them are depressed or stop playing, God forbid, because uh, they're on a very tight schedule. They have to prepare every week uh, an etude or a whole movement to play for their other, for their colleagues. Mm -hmm. And they're sort of competing with each other. They're all, um, uh, they're, they're very competitive. And I, I try to keep the competition going. And they're very excited to be playing uh, next week. Mm -hmm. So they're, you know, and they're allowed to say only good feedback to each other during the meetings uh, at the end. So they get only compliments when they're done playing uh, from all their friends. And that keeps them very, uh, very motivated. And um, also they have, uh, uh, every now and then they have master classes and here they're able to meet for chamber music, the kids. I, I ask them to meet together and play. Um, as soon as they come here for a lesson, the student that was here, the student that is arriving and me, we always play a trio. When you say come, when you say come for a lesson, you mean on the screen? No, no. That's the thing that the lockdown here is is supposed to be taking place constantly, but it starts really at six o'clock when the police. I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, stop the cars outside. So uh, they just some of them just walk here for lessons. We sit with masks. We are four meters apart, and we play chamber music. Uh, with the student that was before and the student that is coming later. So we play trios, so whomever arrives plays chamber music in the beginning of the lesson. Mm -hmm. So they, it's sort of, it's, it's a good atmosphere that way. It stays happy this way. And I tell them, look, when this thing is over, all of you are going to be virtuoso cellists because you're playing constantly very difficult pieces and um, uh, that's what mainly is going on uh, here in, in my class. <clears throat> Serom, how do you deal psychologically with the students? How do they react to these conditions? Yeah, of course, some students, you know, uh, if I don't see them weekly, um, you know, that, you know, they tend not to practice and, you know, they get lazy and, and things like that. But the interesting was that, um, our school, we have before, they could use the practice room anytime. But with this COVID-19, uh, we um, we had to reduce the hours so they could only use the, uh, I mean, it, it varied, but once one time they could only use the practice room uh, for two hours a day. Mm -hmm. Or, um, you know, they could, they had to be out of the practice room by 6 p.m. So with this limitation, interestingly, the students actually practice more because before it was open and they say, they think you know they could, could come anytime and then, but you know they they the practice rooms were empty. But with this limitation and regulation, you know they try to really really fit in the practice time and uh, use the practice room. So that was one thing that I I noticed. Um, and. Mm -hmm. Um, luckily, I got to see my um, cello students every week at, at the school. So, you know, and we did uh, chamber music at the school with mask on. So that was the only thing that was allowed. So two or three or four students get together in one room with masks on and play chamber music. Yes, yes. And I'm teaching. I'm also teaching a chamber music class. Um, there are three chamber music classes that I'm teaching. And of course, it had to be a very big uh, classroom. Mm. And uh, we're like, you know, with uh, social distancing, everything. Yeah, I, I was allowed to teach chamber music on campus. So right. that was, I think, very uh, productive. Mm -hmm. And it was, I think that was something that uh, got, uh, kept the students motivated. Right, right. 
Wayne, you have a huge class probably. You're connected to so many students. What, what's the atmosphere? Um, how do they deal with, with a crisis? Well, I, I have to distinguish between chamber music and cello. With the Hochschule, uh, the idea of teaching chamber music uh, during the hard lockdown was basically impossible. Among other reasons, a lot of students intelligently thought, why am I paying rent in Berlin if I can go back home and have my lesson from there? So I had a quartet with someone in Indonesia, another in Chile, another in Holland, and one in Berlin, yeah? Another <laughs> uh, a guitar duo with voice, uh, one in Turkey, one in, uh, both in Turkey actually, but in different cities, and so on. Um, and some of my colleagues thought it important to have the students play their parts. I, I personally didn't see much sense to that, other that with a few exceptions. So I turned my chamber music teaching into analysis. And I have to say that was good. That, that's something that usually doesn't happen enough that the students take the score and really with great detail, think, where's the phrase, what's the structure, where's my goal, what's interesting here, how can we make it sound? And to me, that was, there are certain benefits in this crisis, lots of disadvantages, but that was one advantage. Uh, just by the by, another advantage is that you can now have administrative uh, meetings and conferences much, much more easily. And I hope that it continues that way after the crisis, because some people can be in other countries. There's, it's, uh, you don't spend all the time traveling. The meetings are shorter. But right. get, get back to the students. Um, Yes, there were, I, know, I can think of a couple of students that really had serious psychological problems. There was a guitarist in London who, who couldn't sleep for weeks on end. Um, I, and also with my cello students, you really can tell which ones are, are serious about it and using the opportunity to have more time to practice and they're excited about it and which ones are not taking it quite as seriously. I don't know if, if some of the others have this experience. I got one of these microphones by Blue microphone, Yeti, USB. Maybe some of my colleagues have similar experience. It makes a huge difference in the quality of my sound, but unfortunately it doesn't do any good <laughs> listening to the students unless they have good equipment and it makes a huge difference. Some of the cell phones my students, my cello students have are almost worthless. You, like we were saying the other day, you can only hear every second tone. Sometimes it just stops or there's delay, etc. Um, one other advantage is you can uh, you can say I'd like to meet twice more this week for ten minutes, uh, which was not as easy when it was in person. Mm -hmm. That's an advantage. Um, yeah. this is the, it, it is a brilliant idea to turn the time in, in, if you cannot play together to simply let learn the score better and start. Yeah. I'm analyzing, uh, uh, discussing voices, uh, or listening to music in general. Yesterday, I gave a talk about interpretation, and um, I used the quote from Das Lied von der Erde, the, uh, the Song of the Earth by Mahler, uh, explaining repetition, because the piece ends with the, the word Avig repeated five times. And, and I, I know there was a small three minutes out of an hour and 15 minute piece. And I said to, to, to the listeners, this is the time you're in isolation. The days are bleeding into one another. You, you have the time. Listen to the entire piece. Uh, under normal circumstances, it would be difficult to take an hour and 15 minutes of the day. Uh, but now we can, we can do that. So there well, are some things that we can uh, benefit. It's, it's strange, but we can draw benefit from this uh, time alone. For instance, I had each of my students in a Haydn quartet. Haydn is especially wonderful for analyzing phrasing. <laughs> I had each one of them share the screen on Zoom with their analysis, with color code, mar where's the phrase, where's the goal, et cetera. That was excellent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Diego, how are your students faring? Um, they are actually quite, uh, quite well. Um, I agree with all you, you are saying. I think... Um, um it's a very hard situation for for the students in particular because uh, we have young people far from home alone uh, with the cello sitting there but not being able to to do what what they are supposed to do and 
for me immediately uh, you know it, it didn't appeal to me to to go in the direction of uh, making videos and and try to to perform in this situation and so I put all my focus on on my students and did some light research and on equipment I also have a, a microphone which makes a huge difference some students you know only have a cell phone others a laptop some others have maybe an external camera a microphone uh, and we we with the equipment that each uh, person has we try to make the best out of it we came up with a with a little system that uh, i asked the students to videotape to record everything that they are going to play in the lesson weekly so instead of starting by playing live we both watch the the videos of what they just recorded uh, probably an hour before the lesson mm -hmm. and we work based on that and that made a huge difference uh, we, we could exploit the the technological possibilities you know by re-watching the videos playing some things with a zoom or in slow motion and i feel that that gave them a, a lot of motivation because they have something more concrete to hold on to right. uh, has anyone else done that pre-record mu the music of the student and then analyze it together with them that's a very interesting possibility yes i have done it also. you've done it also uh, we also, um, I organize uh, studio classes, weekly studio classes, like uh, Shajid was saying. I've been wanting to do that for 10 years and could never do it because of a space uh, situation and scheduling situations. And of course, I'm not saying that I don't, I don't prefer uh, teaching virtually uh, over teaching in person, that's, uh, that's for sure. But there are some things that we can there are some positive things i think that we can hold on to and exploit them for and example, for example uh, well th this uh, for example reviewing a, a video or having the students record themselves weekly and seeing them more than once a week uh, i i ask often my students to send me short videos in the middle of a week in between lessons for a short uh, comment on them and and it, I think it helps them uh, keeping the motivation going and, and you know they, they are practicing and they don't have any performance in front of them or an audition in front of them so I think it's important to to have a, a purpose uh, and maybe think on the short term and and building from there. Uh, the studio classes also we instead of playing live, they show recordings that we watch together. We stream them live at the moment, and then we all comment on it, and that helped them a lot. Yeah, th um, this is this is true for all of us. We all know that what makes us practice best is a deadline. Mm -hmm. You have a concert coming, you practice. Uh, you have a recording, you practice. So uh, you seem to find, you have found a way of giving them these points of uh, little artificial, but deadlines that they work towards. Mm -hmm. Right. It's terrific. Uh, Mikel, are you with us? I am here and Tell us absorbing all of this information. <laughs> how, 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 do you, how do you deal with your students? Well, I, I noticed one thing, and um, it's that the, the lack of that physical connection, the lack of being able to, like you said, to pick up a fourth finger and say it goes this way. Mm -hmm. It's forced to grow as a communicator verbally. It's really forced me to be, to be able to have, you know, to articulate my philosophy of music in a way that you would never have to do if you sat down at the instrument. You play, we learn so much orally. 
Right. And so I've, I think there's a, some, sometimes the connections with the students are even more, in, more interesting and deeper because there's not any, you know, there's more words. So we, we're listening to each other in a way that we never have before. Hmm. Because, and even demonstrating, demonstrating over Zoom, as we all know, even, you know, uh, Wayne has a beautiful blue, blue Yeti. I have decent mics. I have an interface that goes in. But still, it depends on both connections have to be as good for, for it to, to happen. So I, you just have to be able to speak. And I think it's created like a more interesting connection with the students in, in a way that wouldn't be there if it was just, all right, now play goodbye. And this is this right. is my miracle of a teacher and, and whatever, what I offer mm -hmm. to you. And um, the other thing I think is that we have to remember that we're all a bit older. These this new generation, like it seems so unnatural to us, you know, the these black mirrors and appendages that we have. But the this younger generation, Gen Z, you know, people, the undergrads, the early masters, they're from a generation that's born fluent in this technology. So it's even though it's not nothing like the real thing, they are already so much more used to it. And, you know, we, we have to count on their resilience a little more. We, 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 they're tougher than we think is, is all I, is all I've got gotten so far. So out of it. one question that none of us is a prophet, but I would love to hear your vision or your view of guess where we are coming, how and where we are coming out of this. In other words, how much have we gotten used to this new way of communication? How much of it will be left there even when Corona is over? Where is the future of classical music going? Will people con continue to listen to music on the screen rather than go to concerts? Have they gotten used to this reality? Where I know it's a difficult question and uh, your guess is just as good as mine, but I, I'm very eager to hear how you view the future. How do we come out of this? So since you are already on, Mikhail, you start us. Hmm. <laughs> you, you said something very right, but none of us are prophets. <laughs> you, you want to and switch I, to someone else and you, you give it some thoughts first? No, 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 no. I, that, that was my start. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I was being prophetic. <laughs> but um, thus, no, I think I, I think we we see that everyone is craving live music and everyone is craving art, and that's why in unknown places, on undisclosed places, after six p.m. in a certain beautiful country of Israel, people are meeting to read music and and. People are safely defying the restrictions imposed upon them to create this art form. So I think that 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 spirit will always be there. And I think, as I, I'm a big fan of what's happening at Wigmore Hall, like you know, but you know, before the before UK went kind of crazy with with numbers and the the new strain, but they were doing live concerts almost on a daily basis for a, for a certain point where they would bring in an artist and they had people in the audience, kind of like what, what you and I did, Yehuda, for that French Connection concert. So they had all those pieces, Chelsea, you know, member groups would come in and do it. I, I think people are craving it. I think we have to get to a point where we feel comfortable in each other's presence, you know, person A and person B. And I, 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 I'm hopeful. I think, I think we will, we will get there. And I think um, this entire thing that's happening, especially June, July, you know, the whole riots, George Floyd, I think the, the face of music is going to be interesting because there's been this younger generation that I spoke of, they, they've had this beautiful push towards um, inclusivity in classical music and diversity and, and openness. And it'll be interesting to see what comes out because we have to of course you know i'm 34 so i have like one foot in the past and one foot in the in the present and i feel that 
you know, it'll be interesting to see what classical music looks like. And we have to, that, that foot in my past is saying we have to honor and glorify this beautiful music tradition that we've been a part of. We can't cancel Beethoven, uh, but we need to play other people as well. We need to, you know, find out what's good. <laughs> and by the only way to find out what's good is by giving other things a chance. There, there is still a question, what will happen to these holy cows, to, to the Metropolitan Opera and to the New York Philharmonic? Will, will people say, I've done without it for eight months. Hmm. I don't feel so bad about it. Maybe I don't have to continue going. Maybe I should not support. Maybe I should not buy a subscription for the Buenos Aires Philharmonica next year because I'm doing fine without it. That's one option. Or people will be so starving for music that they will double their attendance. And this is very difficult to gauge. Diego, you're nodding your head. What do you think? No, I, I think it's true. It's uh, both ways. Uh, uh, it could be true either way. Hmm. Um, what um what i think is that we just need to be patient and focus on the things that we can um improve or we can do mm -hmm. rather than trying to recreate something uh, i don't know it, uh, i admire people who go and play concerts uh, with no audience and really far apart so far, I, it hasn't appealed to me that much, so i rather wait and, and, and do it uh, later on when I can do it more or less uh, like it, uh, it used to be yeah. and maybe focus my, my energy on, on something else that I feel that I can right. I help think, a little more. I think <laughs> it would be naive to assume that when we say when life returns to normal, hmm that it will be the same normal. I don't think it, right. will, it will ever be the same normal. It will be a different normal. So it could be, be, yeah. yeah. Hagit, what, what do you think the future of the Israeli musical scene is? I, I think a lot, a lot about this, really. Yeah. <clears throat> and I think, because I am a prophet, <laughs> <laughs> I really, but I actually think... No, you're not, you, you live in the country of all the prophets. <laughs> Okay. Let me just call in for a second. Okay. But really, I, uh, I think that people crave uh, closeness and that music is timeless. And because of that, um, I think they're, they're just waiting there behind this closed door. And the second the door opens, they will pour out, rushing, gushing. This is what I feel from speaking to people who are just waiting to go to concerts. They really want so badly to go to a concert. So many people I know just can't wait to hear concerts again. Right. So uh, this so is what I feel. I, yeah. I, that's just from what I talk, I hear from people. This is not that I know what actually can happen. But I am very hopeful and always hopeful. But I feel from what the people say that there is a big chance that the craving uh, will allow uh, concerts to uh, have more people coming to listen to them. Yeah. So, Rome, what, what is your prediction? I don't know what I can predict at this point, but um, I agree with what uh, all of you said. Um, and from just my point of view, yeah, I really star for the live music. Mm. Not playing, not only playing the live music, but just being in the concert hall and then just feeling in the air and the music and the communication. And I really start for that. And, um, you know, at the Seoul Arts Center, you know, we have many, many uh, halls here and taking concerts every day, but it's been canceled, canceled, canceled. And even if the concert goes on, it's very limited number of audience. And so now I think people are really craving for it. Before, they could go to any concert if they wanted to, but now with this uh, restrictions I and mean, they couldn't go. And then, so I think they have more thirst for the live concert. Yeah. But of course, what you said, when we go back to the normal, it's not going to be the normal that we used to experience. But, uh, but you know, for the live music, I think everybody thirsts for that. 
Yeah, you're absolutely right. The, the, the idea of listening to a Beethoven symphony alone at home is so bizarre because there's a certain frisson, there's a certain electricity in the big room with, with two, three, four, a thousand people sit together and they begin to breathe together because the music dictates the pulse of, of the entire crowd. And this is what I miss most, this communal sharing. And that's what you're talking about. So absolutely, I think there's no way to replace that. Wayne, you, you, uh, why don't you conclude this pr prophetic session? I, uh, I'm going to be optimistic. I think quality will out. And what you said, uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I do. OK, um, I, I agree totally about how, how wonderful it is to be in a hall live. I think, though, there are advantages uh, which people can take from the whole internet uh, scene. I, uh, I, for instance, I listened to 23 different versions of the Arpeggio Sonata and discovered some really interesting things online and Spotify that I would never have even wondered about before. Mm -hmm. uh, orchestras here have been very creative in how they've dealt with the uh, performance. I, uh, some orchestras have one-on-one, -on -one, one person playing for one person. Um, uh, Carolyn, maybe you could uh, pull up the DSO clip I have. Uh, my wife's orchestra did something that really I found quite moving online. They invited about 70 freelance string players to join the orchestra string players in Vaughan Williams, uh, variations on theme by Thomas Tallis, and they used the entire Philharmonic as their uh, performance space, all with masks, all uh, separated. Very effective. They, they also, uh, I participated in Mozart flute quartets on a square. They had musicians up in balloons, hot air balloons on the water in boats, on top of tourist buses, performing all over the city, <laughs> wearing masks that said, Berlin needs music. Um, an event like what we're doing right now is something we probably wouldn't have thought of doing until this crisis uh, inspired us. There's a, a wonderful series uh, from my Hochschule called Gerstein Invites, um, where he uh, interviewed people like Thomas Adez or Ivan Fischer, who gave a very interesting lecture, The Future of the Symphony Orchestra, which I would recommend to everybody.
But the point was, th this lecture can be watched all over the world, and not just live, but in the uh, it's there for the future. So those are advantages that are much more in focus because of the situation, but nothing replaces the live music. And I frankly don't, I'm a little concerned with all these people that get so excited about collage concerts and playing virtuoso cello duos with themselves because uh, I'm afraid people might start to think this really replay, can replace the real thing. As Michael said, Michael said, it's, uh, this is all not the real thing. The real thing is live. Yeah. So true, Wayne. So true. We have a friend. She is an elderly lady in her 80s, and she's been in isolation. She went to see the doctor, and the doctor shook her hands when she came into the office, and she started crying. And she said to him, it's the first time in months that someone is touching me. Uh, it's, it's a reminder to all of us how the human contact is, is essential for our well-being. And the reliance on technology and those very sophisticated, clever machines is also a little worrisome. I had a, a concert in Miami, and I arrived in town around midnight, very late, and a very sleepy clerk at the, the reception <clears throat> was clicking uh, on his computer and he said, sorry, sir, you, you have already checked in. And I said, no, 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 I'm standing right here. And he said, no, 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 sir, you already are in your room. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean I'm in your room? He said, the computer says that you are in your room. This is how far we go trusting the, the equipment rather than trusting our common sense and our, our human instincts. So this is what we have to watch for, I think. Um, it is really so wonderful for me, a thrill to see all of you thriving in spite of everything and engaged with music and with the students and with your families. Let's stay in touch and let's survive this together. And we'll meet and celebrate on the other side of it. So thank you all for being here. Any other comments anybody wants to make, please. I just think um, <clears throat> that one thing the corona or the COVID has brought uh, to me is the possibility to teach students abroad. Mm -hmm. Now, during this time, from, for example, festivals in which I taught before, um, all of a sudden, they and I realized that they can get a lesson like that. Just set a time, they get a lesson, they sit in Canada, they, they sit in Germany, yeah. they're in New York, and we have a lesson. That's incredible to yeah. me. That's one of the things that is a present that the that, Quran that brought to me. I'm just talking about me. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm sure that everyone else uh, yeah, we, this is one, one compensation we get one. from Corona, that we can actually connect to every corner in the, in the earth, and this is the proof of it. Here you are, all together, in quotes, together, but still together. So God bless all of you. Stay well, stay safe, and let's Thank stay in you. touch. Thank you all. All the best to everyone. Thank you. Stay well. Stay healthy. Very good to see you. Wonderful to see you too, Diego. Fabulous. Thank you all so much for offering your insight, your predictions, your observations. And it was it was a joy and a pleasure for me to listen as a training musician and as a fellow musician who has tried to adapt to our current situation. It was really fascinating for me to hear how you've all adapted and what your plans are and I absolutely agree. I don't think we'll ever go back to 100% normal the way things were. Um, but I absolutely agree. Live concerts don't, they're irreplaceable. So support your musicians, everyone. Go to live shows once it's safe, once you have clearance, and hopefully we'll all be reunited in some fashion soon. Thank you all so much for joining us. And Again, I encourage all of you to check out our events that are going on through January 5th. So we have 
events going on today. And I'm going to put a link in the chat. And that is our schedule where you all can sign up completely free and open to the public. Everything is on Zoom later today. Just to quickly recap what's going on for our Monday, all times are in Eastern Standard. 2 p.m., we have a luthier, Francis Morris, talking about winter care for string instruments. 4 p.m., we have a violin masterclass with Irina Mirsanu of the University of Maryland. And at 8 p.m. tonight, our very own Yehuda Hanani is giving a cello masterclass. So again, we are so grateful for you all for joining us. Thank you again to all of our panelists and Mr. Hanani. And we hope to see you again soon for another event.